Hey everyone and and welcome uh, from Sweden. Actually, this is the second time I've uh, had the pleasure of hosting an Inside Edge webinar and podcast from, from Europe. Uh, it's considerably lighter uh, this time around, uh, at this time of year in Sweden. But, you know, the, the content that we have today is no less important. Uh, um, this is the latest edition of our Inside Edge series. You know, this is something we started when the pandemic hit, you know, as a way to keep in touch with everybody out there, uh, to continue networking, to share our ideas, because, you know, we know it's really, really important. I mean, one of the great things about Ritchie Brothers is we have this wonderful opportunity to get together at live events, and that got curtailed a little bit with the pandemic. And by the way, knock on wood, we're coming out of it and, and you know, look for those live events to be coming back soon. But anyway, we want to continue with these informative sessions because, you know, the feedback we've gotten has just been so useful. And, and today we have a session that is no different than what we've had in the past. Uh, just unreal external content. We're going to focus on the trucking industry today. Uh, we've got an amazing panel of experts. Uh, you know, from from the research space, from the trucking space, from the finance space, and, and then some of our own RB folks. So really looking forward to the conversation today. Uh, keep in mind, you can ask questions by typing them in uh, and we'll respond to them, uh, you know, when we get near the end. But what's interesting about today is we we just got a ton of amazing content, right? I mean, the stuff that's going on in the world today you know, I mean, as we emerge from the pandemic, we're starting to see a lot of economic implications of the past year and a half from supply chain shortages to inflation to interest rates. And all of this is having an impact on our daily lives. I mean, for me personally, I think most people, a lot of you know, I'm a huge golfer. Uh, let me tell you a little story that's kind of related to this. Um, you know, I play golf with a, a guy that runs, he's CFO for kind of like a car dealership group in, in Santa Clara. And, and, you know, we have these tournaments that, you know, you, they have the cars for the hole in ones and lo and behold, at the tournament this year, somebody won a car. Cars are in such precious commodity that he went to the person and said, Hey, can I keep the car and just give you the money? Right? Because I mean, it's the same, it's the same kind of thing we're going to be talking about today. You know, the supply chain, inflation, everything has got trucks uh, in very, very much high demand. And we've got an expert panel to talk about tonight. So let me have them introduce themselves and then we'll jump into the presentation. So, Steve, let's start with you. Got to make sure I get unmuted here, Matt. So thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, it's good to be back on the inside edge again. I'm Steve Tam. I work for ACT Research. We're a market research company that helps folks understand what's happening in this crazy space that you mentioned, right? Commercial vehicles. So I'm based in Columbus, Indiana, and I've got 20 years, actually more than 20 years with the company and uh, coming up on 30 years in the industry. And, you know, I can say over that time frame, we've seen a lot of cycles and everyone is different. So looking forward to uh, delving into the detail on what makes this one unique. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Columbus, Indiana, I can't believe, you know, I'm from Ohio originally and, I'm, you know, I can't believe how far I, I'm away from home. Uh, you know, Stacy, uh, you know, brief intro. OK, um, Stacy Jenkins, the uh, president of the Toronto Trucking Association. Actually, that's my one job. I, I, that's my kind of side job. I'm also the uh, traffic manager for Thompson Terminals Transportation, a warehousing company in Toronto. Um, this is part of being the president with the Toronto Trucking Association. It's an association made up of uh, no, numerous carriers in around the Toronto area uh, and also companies that service the industry, um, you know, such as insurance companies. There are some finance companies. We have trailer repair companies, tire companies. We have trailer manufacturing, tractor manufacturing. And we have told about 120 members uh, that we run and we run you know, various networking events throughout. And then my role with Thompson Terminals, uh, they, they had traffic manager, dealing a lot with rating, uh, with rates and contracts, and and dealing with you know, a lot of the, some of the spot market uh, rates that go on out there. Great, great. Thanks for joining us tonight. And we have Michael Zim from the finance space. Michael.
Sorry about that. Uh, so I'm mute myself. <laughs> uh, I'm Michael Zim. I'm with uh, BMO Transportation Finance. Um, if you're not familiar with BMO or, or our business, uh, BMO's, uh, I think at last count, the eighth largest bank in North America with uh, close to a trillion dollars in assets uh, and about 40,000 employees. Um, the transportation finance business was actually acquired by BMO. Uh, back towards the end of uh, 2015. Uh, the business has, it has been around for more than 40 years. Most of our senior executives have, uh, have been around since the beginning of the business. It's been under various nameplates and, and ownership um, groups over, the, you know, over that time and uh, most recently with, uh, with BMO. Uh, we, um, we have several hundred employees across North America. Uh, we've got obviously uh, being under the BMO umbrella, we've got a big presence in Canada, but of course, uh, most of our bread is buttered in the US uh, and we've got a presence pretty much from, uh, from coast to coast. Um, we finance uh, uh, tractors, trailers, medium duty vehicles, um, alternative fuel vehicles, uh, and increasingly, of course, uh, EVs uh, as, as they come onto the market, we'll be um, addressing that, that market as well from a financing standpoint. Uh, and of course, as a full service bank, uh, we'll do everything from your investment banking needs, uh, M&A, uh, treasury payments, uh, whatever you need outside of the traditional uh, core equipment um, uh, financing business that we have. Uh, I'm, I'm the uh, market intelligence uh, analyst uh, for the business. Uh, so I'm sort of a jack of all trades. I help support our, um, our sales folks, our risk folks, our senior executives uh, in almost any capacity that they need from a, uh, uh, a market intelligence uh, information flow standpoint. And I've been with the business for about 10 years at this point. Cool. Great. Thanks, Michael. And then we have uh, Rob Slavin from our own RB family who knows more about truck pricing than anyone I've ever met. Rob? Hi. Uh, yeah, so uh, Rob Slavin, Senior Valuation Analyst um, for Ritchie Brothers. I've been with Ritchie Brothers for about five years. I uh, I track the highs and lows of the transportation industry, and uh, I, I follow uh, heavy, medium um, buses, dumps, uh, just trying to stay in tune with what's going on. I've got good relationships with all the OEMs, many dealers out there, and I've been in the industry for about 30 years, um, primarily in the used truck side of the of the business. Great, and for the first time, we have Michael Kitching joining us, who does a lot with our transportation energy north of the our transportation sector north of the border. Michael, yeah, thanks, Matt. Uh, appreciate being on. Uh, I'm Mike Kitching, transportation asset manager for Ritchie Brothers Auctioneers for Ontario, Montreal, and Atlantic Canada. I've been on with Ritchie Brothers for about the past year and a half. Prior to that, I have about 35 years of uh, transportation experience in the industry. Uh, I come from a family-owned business that is uh, four generations and recently sold. So uh, I've been a Ritchie Brothers customer for over 30 years. And um, yeah, great people at Ritchie Brothers and glad to be part of the team. Thank you. Awesome. So you can see we've probably got more knowledge about trucks uh on this plant on this panel than the internet can handle tonight so what what are we going to talk about right so um here here are the types of questions you know when when we're you know day in day out you know in the trucking space you know these are the types of things we hear every day from our customers our partners uh, our consigners um and so we want to walk through these things with you tonight because we know as, as i sort of talked about in the beginning you know, what's going on right now is very, very unique. I mean, I personally, you know, gosh, I'm, I'm north of 50. You know, I haven't seen an economy like this. I doubt many of us have. And so, you know, these are questions that I think we, you know, we go to sleep with at night, we wake up with in the morning. And so what we want to do is, you know, get some folks together and, and try to kind of, you know, basically sort this out and, and see if we can actually provide you know, shed some light on, on, hey, what's going on and what might be coming in the future. 
So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to turn it over to Steve, who's going to kick us off uh, on, you know, just from a research standpoint, what is going on? All right, Matt, thank you very much for that. So yeah, what's going on? I, I liked your comment about uh, going to sleep at night and waking up in the morning. Um, actually, I'm staying awake at night thinking about some of these questions. Uh, you cannot turn on the news or listen to the to the internet or read and pick up a newspaper and not hear about somebody somewhere who can't get the pieces and the parts that they're looking for. And the commercial vehicle industry is no different. Uh, you know, at the top of the list are the, are the semiconductor chips or the computer chips. We've all been hearing about those now for, for probably coming up on a year. But there are literally dozens of other assemblies, components, pieces, parts, raw materials uh, that are all in short supply. You know, as, as uh, the North American market and really the global market started recovering very quickly after COVID, we as consumers, um, businesses, manufacturing, all started demanding more stuff, whatever that stuff might be, uh, and in a big way. And, uh, you know, the, the manufacturers or the producers of those things were challenged because we hadn't gotten our workforce back uh, in place yet. It wasn't reestablished. Even today, uh, we're still working to try to get back the full complement of workers that we had before the virus. And so that all led to this, uh, this whole supply chain constraint uh, issue that we're up against today. And of course, that's had the, the net effect on the new truck side of the business, uh, slowing down production and slowing down deliveries. And if a new truck buyer can't take delivery of the truck that they're waiting for, uh, guess what? They're not going to let the one go that's going off lease or that they were planning on trading in when they got that new truck. And so in the secondary market, in the used truck market, we have the same phenomenon taking place. We don't have access to nearly as much inventory as we did before the pandemic. Not to say that we don't have inventory. There, there are units out there. Um, they're just not as many as we need. They might not be where we want them, might not be the spec that we're looking for, certainly not the price that we want. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on in the presentation. But um, if we can turn to the next slide, let me kind of show you a picture in the new truck world of what's happening right now. So that chart on the left um, shows us the number of orders that uh, folks have placed for, this is just class eight trucks that we're looking at right here in the North American market. And the black line in particular is what I'm talking about. So we've got orders for about 250,000 class eight trucks that have yet to be built. Uh, that's in and of itself a pretty impressive number. You can see the history over the past couple of years of where we've been. We're not at an all-time high in terms of the number of unbuilt trucks, but we are at what we think is probably close to the cyclical peak. The blue bars down at the bottom show you that at the rate that the truck manufacturers are pumping trucks off the line right now, how long it would take to work through or to deliver those 250,000 orders. And you can see we're banging on a year. Uh, so if you ordered a truck today, uh, you can potentially expect to wait as long as a year to get that truck. And it's not just trucks. The graph on the right shows a very similar picture for trailers. Now we've, we've kind of come off of our high water mark for trailers. Um, you can see at the end of June, we were probably between eight and nine months out with respect to delivery. They're not as complicated, uh, don't have as many semiconductors in them. Uh, and so, you know, that, that gives us maybe a little bit of relief on the, on the trailer side. So I think I've got another slide. Oh, no, I guess I don't have another slide. This is going to be Rob. Let me set it up for Rob. He's going to tell you maybe uh, specifically on OEMs and, and by some of the equipment types what the exact dates are that he's hearing from his contacts out in the field. So Rob, uh, tell us what you know, man. Uh, I think it's Michael. Oh, okay. Then let's yep. let Michael take it. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Steve. <clears throat> yeah. Um, interesting times for sure. You know what? Um, like I said, I've been, I've been in the transportation business a long time. Uh, got to know a lot of the local dealers. 
very well for pretty much every make and model out there. And uh, so I have a good relationship with them and, and I like to go and visit on them and um, see what they're still seeing in the industry out there. You know what, when I walk in the door, I uh, I feel bad for them at times because customers will come in, good customers, and, and they'll order equipment and they'll associate timelines to it. The OEMs will confirm timelines. And then just like Steve mentioned, you might run into a case where all of a sudden we're short on semiconductors or we're short on tires or we're short on axles or spiff componentry or anything like that. So obviously that pushes the timeline back. The cut or the OEM or the dealer has to relay that to the customer. Obviously the customer is not going to be very happy depending on if he's already tried to time the market right capitalize on selling his equipment now while everything's extremely high and then there's delays of him getting his new ones so it it puts a lot of stress and it puts um, a lot of strain we'll say on the relationships with the customers when when they have to hear that uh, that their trucks aren't going to be in on time so um, just kind of a brief overview of some of some of the uh, OEMs and the dealers that I've talked to in the local market so the Kenworth and Peterbilt dealers that fall under the PACAR umbrella. When I talk to them, they're anticipating their new truck deliveries, if you ordered one now, probably into the spring of 2022. And talking to the international dealers, the international dealers um, a little bit more optimistic. They're hoping that their delivery dates are going to land somewhere at the end of Q1 of 2022. Um, Mac and Volvo. Mac and Volvo. Mac is anticipating spring of 2022 as well. Volvo is kind of interesting. It's kind of a, a moving target or to be determined because uh, they had some strike issues at some of their facilities. So I think that has been uh, ratified since um, just in the last few weeks. So we'll have a better idea shortly where those timelines are going to play out. And then talking to the, some of the Freightliner dealers, they're basically pushed out uh, mid to late spring of 2022. Now, like like Steve said about van trailers um, and the extreme high demand for those dry vans, reefers, and um, trailers like that are basically, we're hearing fourth quarter of 2022 and in some instances even 2023. Uh, flatbeds, end dumps, live bottoms configurations. They're still pretty reasonable target with the with the delivery dates in the spring of 2022 as well. Um, steel box orders for the vocational market that that's got pushed out quite substantially as well. So it's it's pushed out to uh, late spring of of 2022. So that's kind of what we're seeing in in a lot of. Uh, the dealers that I've talked to as of late. So that's kind of the Coles Notes version of what I got. And uh, yeah, I think it's yeah. you're up, Rob. No, no, interesting. And, um, you know, uh, don't hold our breath, right? Now, I uh, I, I failed Econ uh, 101. So, Rob, but I think I can still guess the impact on pricing that all this is uh, that all this is having. Yeah, I mean, we really are in the best of times. You know, like I said in my intro, I've been in the business for about 30 years, and I can't remember a time where we've been collecting the kind of money that we're collecting now. Even when you take into consideration how much trucks have gone up in price over the last 10 years, I mean, uh, it's really, we're really seeing um, pricing that we've never seen in the past. Um, he, with this first slide, I really like uh, what we have here. Our data scientists uh, here at Ritchie Brothers put together what we call the uh, mixed adjusted pricing index, and we can we can run this on the variety of different equipment that we sell. In this case, we're using truck tractors sold in the U.S. Um, and basically, what it does is take into consideration what's happened in the last um, historically in the last three months, and then. Uh, puts that onto a graph that says whether the market's going up or down. And as you can see, um, it, it's just exploding. Uh, generically, 
trucks are up 30%, but when you look at specific ages of equipment out there, it's up even much more than that. We're talking 60, 70, and 80% uh, from previous times, depending on what time frame you're looking at. Uh, and another thing what I like about this, we're looking at 14 years of data. And, and when I think about the cycles that that heavy truck uh, class eight equipment goes through, it's like a roller coaster, right? You think about some of the worst of times, 2009, when transport topics, you know, headline trucks drop uh, 50% in value. Um, that was that was a very rough rough go, especially if you had equipment that you priced the previous year. Um, you were in you were in rough shape. Whereas this year, um, if you were pricing with expectation of of expecting some depreciation to hit the equipment you're going to be getting, uh, you're you're never been in a better position to make some money. So I like this. It kind of gives the highs and lows of what we've seen throughout time. And really, like I said, we're we're in the best of times right now. Next slide. So um, I, I like this slide as well. The right side kind of shows normal depreciation, what we saw last year. And basically what we're doing is taking 2014 through 17 Freightliners, combining their performance and then looking at how they perform. And you notice uh, we see normal depreciation. This is kind of what we expect. Um, in normal times where we see just a, as, as, as miles go up, gradual price comes down. Whereas if you're looking on the left-hand side, we're looking at what's going on uh, today and we're really not seeing the normal depreciation you'd expect to see. A uh, couple examples. So I ran specifically the highest selling units that we sell here are really six and seven year old sleepers. That's the most frequently sold piece of equipment. Those are actually selling for $15,000 higher than they did the previous year. Um, that's pretty, that's, we don't really see that. We, I can't remember a point in time where we've seen that in the past. Uh, another example, 2015 Freightliner sleepers, uh, going back two years, we're actually selling the same model year truck for $15,000 higher than we did uh, two years ago. So it's just another jaw dropping thing that we don't see. Um, 2019 wasn't a fantastic year. There was a lot of oversupply in the market from the success that that new truck had in the previous year. So there was quite a bit of uh, equipment out there. So it wasn't one of the greatest years, but 2018 was a very good year when you look at pricing and, and we're even exceeding those numbers. So um, so yeah, I mean, just uh, depreciation has been uh, um, non-existent. Really, it's been uh, inflation, right? Which is what we've seen for a lot of things out there. Next slide. So this is Canada's look uh, at depreciation. Very similar. Whoop. Yeah, very similar situation. Um, uh, Canada's uh, up in value, not quite as high as what I've seen in the US, but still um, the pricing that we're seeing in both US and Canada is just really off the charts. Um, uh, again, normal depreciation on the right, what we're seeing currently right now um, on the left is, is almost non-existent. So uh, dollar value wise, uh, you know, units uh, up uh, 19 to $28,000, median prices up 47%. So that's, it's pretty, pretty amazing what we're seeing here. Um, how long is it going to last? That's the question I get. Uh, you know, the question I ask is how long is the supply shortage going to hold out for? You know, when are we going to start seeing semiconductors? When are we going to start seeing, you know, engine transmissions? When are manufacturers going to start releasing units that are caught up in reg tag? As soon as the large amount of equipment that's that's held up in reg tag due to supply shortages that's going to have an impact and it's probably going to take about 60 to 90 days before it hits the market um, but uh, we'll start seeing prices drop this isn't going to last forever uh, you'd like to think that it's going to but it's not and as soon as supply hits uh, um, at normal levels we'll start seeing the numbers drop down From a, uh, from a fleet maintenance perspective, um, 
uh, we get this quite a bit. Hey, what, what should I do when we bring in our equipment? Uh, I'm a big proponent to, uh, you know, spending some money on that piece of equipment. You're trying to attract retail buyers. We, we get retail, uh, retail uh, buyers and dealers, and, and ultimately you're trying to attract the most, uh, as many retail dollars bidding on your equipment, as many retail buyers bidding on your equipment as possible. So at minimum, we wanna do a full detailed job. Uh, we wanna uh, consider cleaning the interior, exterior, you know, fixing minimal body work. It's, it's not, you don't have to spend $10,000 if you have a normal truck that's gone through a normal wear and tear. You know, uh, customers are accepting of normal wear and tear. Uh, I've got an example for you where we had a truck come in that had uh, non-existent rubber. Um, it, we had to change that out, or it was recommended that it was changed out and it was missing a bumper. Other than that, the truck was in great condition. Uh, the miles were low. Um, my, my opinion, it was supposed to get $55,000. It dramatically fell short because at the end of the day, retail buyers don't want to buy projects. Projects they don't they want to buy something that they can they can put to work in days, not weeks. So uh, whenever we have the opportunity, whenever I have the opportunity to coach up customers on what they need to do their equipment, it's always um, you know consider a full detail. If rubber's low, get that fixed up. Um, you know, in terms of spending more times than not, if you're going to spend one, two, three thousand dollars, you're going to get that back um, uh, through bids, right? So, so how many bids can I pull out from an extra three thousand dollars I sell? Well, you could easily say that you're going to get another five bids on that, and depending on what the bid increments are, it could easily pay you back. Yeah, I think that's I think that's interesting, Rob. I mean, I think one of the things we've seen, and you know, we've talked about this on the past uh, Edge podcast, is is just during these times we've seen, uh, you know, you mentioned it, an influx of retail buyers, you know, to you know to our marketplace, and and I think, you know, as we've transitioned online. You know, obviously, as online is is sort of encroaching on you know people's behaviors. You know what you see is is the retail buyer more and more comfortable buying trucks. I mean, we introduced something called priority bidding. Um, gosh, about two years ago now, a little over. Oh, gosh, almost three years ago, maybe. And you know, you look at what our top category is for priority bidding, which is people bidding ahead of the auction, mostly retail buyers, because you know that's when they they have the time to do it. It's truck tractors, and so you know the stuff Rob is talking about you know, making that unit, making that machine sort of more attractive to the retail buyer, you're seeing more and more of those at the sales. And so that that can help drive pricing. So that's yeah, really Matt, great commentary. Yeah. Yeah, Matt, and if I could just add on to that, I mean, if you're, if you're a business owner and, and you come and you purchase a piece of equipment and, and you bring it back to the, to your home base or to your yard, and your employees are there, they see you drive in with a nice clean piece of equipment with good rubber on it that shows well, that's detailed. They're gonna be proud to drive that truck, right? Where versus coming in and seeing the bumper hanging off of it, um, filthy dirty, tires are bald, everything else. You're gonna have a hard time convincing a driver to get in that truck and, uh, and take it down the road. So. Exactly that. So let's talk about, you know, let, let, you know, so we talked about the equipment, but let's talk about the industry. You know, I mean, we know the impact, uh, you know, COVID has had on e-commerce and we've seen that in, you know, my God, you know, you, you, you walk down the street and, you know, you look at our, our neighborhood and there's just piles of Amazon boxes and piles of e-commerce boxes <laughs> stacking up, you know, that that's, you know, affecting freight prices, right? Yeah. You're you're absolutely right, Matt. I'm gonna I'm gonna start out fielding this question. So, uh, you know, it's it's been interesting. Uh, it's it's your economics 101 comment a little bit earlier, right? Um, we've got all this freight to haul, all the Amazon packages uh, we keep buying. 
Um, and we've got this population of trucks over here to do that work. Uh, there's a key element though that's that's uh, kind of missing. One, we don't have enough trucks, but even if we could get the trucks, we're having a challenge getting drivers. And again, that's a topic we'll delve into here in just a minute. But the net effect of that is that we're seeing um, freight rates and it doesn't matter whether you're looking at spot rates, uh, contract rates, it doesn't matter whether you're looking at dry vans, at refrigerated vans, um, at, the, at the platform or flatbed market, any of the specialty markets. Freight rates uh, since, uh, since COVID reared its ugly head have done nothing but go up. Uh, the slide that you're looking at here comes from the folks at DAT and it's kind of a, we've aggregated this data, taking the different types of trailers or different types of freight and, and basically put together an index. And what this shows you is that, you know, we're basically at record high levels with respect to freight rates. And that has a couple of implications. One, uh, the used truck buyers who typically service this spot freight market have more available funds to come in and buy these trucks that we're seeing zoom out of the market uh, at, at higher prices and at much faster rates. So that's one takeaway. Another takeaway, um, I think Rob was the one that mentioned, you know, kind of a rebalancing. So he said, when we start to see a supp the supply of used trucks coming back up to where it is normally, we'll get some relief on that pricing front. Well, the same dynamic is going to happen here with rates, right? When we get those trucks in place and we get the drivers in place, we'll start to see the growth in rates taper off, but we're still going to be at relatively high levels relative to where we've been historically. So very profitable time right now for truckers and for freight. And we, you can see we expect that to continue through, uh, through the remainder of this year. Um, if I would stick another year on this graph, I'd tell you that, you know, at the end of 2022, we're still going to be seeing rates probably north of $2 a mile. Uh, so better really than most of the time that you see in the history of this chart. Uh, so, you know, we're in the business of forecasting and, and we do grade ourselves. So we'll be checking back in to see how we're doing on that forecast and how the market's doing. So. There's something something to consider some breaking news. I don't know if everyone has heard it that um, the CBSA or Canadian Border Services have have voted to strike. Um, you know, they haven't gone out the door yet, but you know, if a strike happens at the border in terms of Canada, again, that's going to cause implications across for supplies and everything. Again, trying to get across the border, trying to get up here, uh, again, trying to get drivers to cross the border. Uh, during uh, during a strike like that, so they, that can uh, make a, another difference on the charts. So again, you know, we've seen so many different things that have, have you know have impacted it, and said particularly COVID uh, with us up in Canada, you know, the various lockdowns and the various rules that come into play with lockdowns. You know, what industries are shut down, what is shut down. Uh, we saw through the the months when the really through April, May. When they shut down all of the uh, the general merchandise and stores, basically stores could only sell the groceries. You know, all of a sudden, trucking companies that were involved in shipping these general merchandises all of a sudden had a lot of availability and they had a lot of trucks going out there looking for work. Uh, then, when things let go, and then when the governments make the announcements and they open things back up, you see the big peak and you see the big spike, and you can kind of see what the, you know, what goes on with the rates uh, that kind of follows through that. So there's a you know, it's just again a lot of uh, things affecting the rates across in us in Canada as well. Excellent, and you know, I I still think we have a driver shortage, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So that's that's we'll get into that one in the next one. It's you know, the next topic, but yeah, that's uh, that's really that's driving a lot of the rates, the growth of rates as well. Is just it'll continue as as the, and I don't see that changing, and that's the thing that's going to keep driving the rates up again. Is just in terms of availability. Um, so rates will continue to climb as shippers are looking for units to move it and then you just don't have it. You know, there, there isn't the availability of available trucks and drivers. So if we get into the, the driver shortage, are we uh, moving across the driver yeah, shortage now? So, okay, so, the driver shortage. 
but you know, I look at you know so it's something I you know I look at it. It's not something that's been new. Um, you know, I, I had a, a thing here. It's a little pamphlet that shows there was meetings back in 2016 with the president of the Ontario Trucking Association discussing you know the the effects of, of driver shortage. So this is five years ago, and I'd say it even kind of started a bit before then. Uh, that there's been you know a big a big change in that and you know, right now we look at uh, the way it's kind of going uh, you know we have a rapidly aging driver force if you look at the drivers across the board you're seeing a lot of drivers are very are getting old they're getting older you know particularly when we talked about the highway drivers uh, so these people are going to be retiring and there isn't the backfill of, of people there to take these jobs as they kind of as they go through um, you know there isn't the young new entrants and then we think back to in the last probably you know 15 20 years you look at people and, and families and what are parents telling their kids they're telling them to become doctors lawyers you know uh teachers all that you know there's been a big movement away from the trades of which you know truck driving is you know considered a, as a trade uh, but there's been a huge movement away from that so there hasn't been anyone going into it um you know and I, you know i look at one of our truck drivers i even talked to you know, some of our highway drivers and the one told me quite blank he said no i won't I tell my I, I told my son not to get into truck driving so that's been some, a real barrier that we need to kind of overcome to get people to come back into the trade and get into the driving so you know particularly in Canada you know the, the driver shortage is going to really affect you know the, the the major points for us is Ontario Quebec uh, BC where you know the bulk of all your trade crosses the border um, so that's going to be great like right now they're estimating for us by the year 2024 there could be as much as a 34,000 you know, uh, driver shortage, uh, which is huge. It's a, it's a big number. It's a scary number. It will make it difficult again to ship you know, the goods back and forth, particularly across the border. Um, you know, presently, there's probably as many, they're figuring it could be as much as 20,000 empty vacant positions within Canada uh, for truck drivers. So that, that's going to end. It's going to keep things um, very tight. Uh, very hard to move freight. It'll, it'll keep their freight rates up because, again, a lack of availability. Um, you know, we look into you know, what is causing a lot of the reasons for the driver turn, the driver shortage. Um, they're seeing there's high turnover. You know, uh, there's a huge, a huge turnover in terms of drivers. You know, low pay, lack of respect for the job, poor working conditions. Uh, you know, we see what you know some of the lack of respect in our industry uh, with what we went through in COVID. You know, there was the drivers who were going down the road and could not get access to a bathroom. You know, these are guys who are on the road. They're away from home. Uh, they need access to these facilities and they were being denied, um, you know, through the thing as well. And I heard the funny stories of, about drive throughs where, you know, when we had the food services, everything was closed. You know, the only thing that was open was the drive throughs And, you know, we had the truck driver who cannot take his truck through the drive through he has to be able to pull over on the side of the road. He has to get out and walk up to the drive-through, and they were and they were being denied food service. And it's like, you know, these are people working 10, 12, 14 hour days. You know, and they need access to these things. So we see the kind of lack of respect that was was accorded to these people. Um, secondly, low wages. I mean, wages have not kept up with the cost of living, um, shipping rates. Uh, it's funny because I you know I talked to my father. My father spent 45 years in the in the business with Kingsway Transport. And when I tell him, you know, what we get paid today to haul a load between Toronto and Montreal, he kind of laughs and chuckles and says, I used to get paid more like, more back in the 80s than you're getting paid now, you know. And when you look at that, you know, the, the, you know, where the rates and the, where the freight rates are, we know since the 80s what has gone up. Everything's gone up huge, you know, the cost of equipment, the cost of service, cost of maintenance and that. So something has to give or something has to suffer in that. And it's probably been, been a lot more, you know, the biggest thing has been the uh, the driver wages. So um, the other things we get into is too much unpaid time. You know, particularly when drivers are paid by the mile and they go down the road and they're getting stuck in a snowstorm, traffic jams or construction. And that load that should take, you know, six hours to, to get somewhere is taking eight, nine, ten hours. But because when you're still paid by the mile and, and drivers, that's what they do. They compute it down to usually they break things down into how much I make it. Am I making in an hour uh, at the end of the day? Um, you know, when we see things like that and, uh, you know, again, we talk about respect and, and too much unpaid time. And, you know, when a driver drives through a snowstorm and we see it in our, in our industry, you know, driver, you know, goes through a snowstorm, does the 10 hours, 11 hours that, you know, some of the show takes six and he gets to the shipper, uh, the receiver and, you know, sorry, we're closing. Come back tomorrow morning. So well, here the drivers just you know busted his hump and gone through that, you know, made the, all that extra effort to get there, 
and now he has to wait till the next morning. So again, you know, this is it's a matter of how much can you pay these people to sit overnight and wait till the next morning. And you know, again, it goes lack. We talked about lack of respect. Um, as we move into the new electronic log age, you know, we have restricted driving hours. I'm not saying they were fudging their logbooks before. That's not, you know, that's not the way it was working. Uh, but you know, again, just restricted hours um, of how they can drive, where you know they have to shut down at various times. Um, so that's going to have an effect on it. You know, unfair fines are some of the things that at times drivers feel that they're being unfairly targeted uh, when it especially comes to road safety. Um, when we look at what goes on the road and there's, you know, there's all kinds of people cutting trucks off and we look at it and you go, you have to go drive down the 401 here in Toronto and you watch how many people are pulling in front of a truck when that truck has left his, his distance, he's left his braking distance. And again, you know, it's part of the respect thing, you know, they're just being cut off by the cars. Um, you know, unfair treatment. Again, we talk about, uh, you know, just again, uh, paid by the mile, high risks. You know, there's a lot of high risks associated with the job. You know, particularly you said, when accidents, when you start putting in a million miles, or you know, when you're doing so many miles that you know, the, you know, when all the risks increase, um, the, just too much time away from the family. And as I mentioned, is again, the hard part is going to be trying to get particularly highway drivers. As we know, the family dynamics have changed a lot. In the old days, when it used to be, you know, one income family when they had the drive, the, the husband who was pretty much doing the work and the wife could stay at home and take care of the kids. We're not seeing that anymore. You're seeing two people who are working. And so, you know, the, for the other person, they don't want one person away the entire week. They need that person there as well. So when now it's going to be hard to get people to jump in a truck on a Sunday night and stay in the truck till Friday night. So that's again, just because of too much time away from the family. So these are the, a lot of things that are doing. Now, how do we tackle it? That's the big question. How I know uh, the driver shortage with the uh, the Ontario Trucking Association. They've been working with the government um, in terms of also trying to get the truck driver job. And what we do is in, in Canada, you know, with the government, that they do have some special exemptions that they'll fast track immigrate immigrants or new people to the country. If you have a particular job or trade, they will let you in earlier or reduce some of the red tape uh, to make it faster. So they've been pushing to get the truck driver job included in that list so that we can try to fast track some immigration a little more and try to get some more people into the, the country here who can drive a truck and we're ready to jump behind the wheel. Um, then also with the training, they've been working hard with the government because we know it's very costly for uh, people to go to school and to get your, your AZ license and that, that there is a, a big cost, it's upfront cost associated with that. So they've been working with trying to get some extra grants and then that and some money to help people and make it more attractive to to get that uh, that trade and take up that trade so it's not so cost prohibitive yeah so, stacy uh i can jump in on that if you want so yep so um yeah graduated licensing that's uh that, that's a big uh big change for a lot of people come into effect a few years ago so that that's one of the struggles, I guess, with the graduated licensing. It has to be done at a, an accredited school, and the cost of an AZ license is somewhere approximately between eighty-five hundred and ten thousand dollars. And part of that course requires you to do one hundred and three point five hours of time, which equates to somewhere of about an eight-week course. So not a lot of many people, not a lot, of, not a lot of people can take that time away if they already have an existing job to do all the training and and spend time to do this or let alone have the money to do that. Uh, there are government subsidies that Stacy mentioned there for um, second career people. So um, people that if they are injured at work and they need to change their line of work, there, there's funding for that or there's funding for people that are laid off or unemployed. There's also funding for that. And and like he mentioned, the e-logs um, with with the aging driving force of of the guys, um, a lot of old drivers, if they're close to the end of their career cycle, they're not doing well with change, and and there's always fear of change, and and you'll see them probably retire early. Uh, the other thing that that is a big issue to try and get drivers is insurance. So a lot of these insurance companies are requiring. Uh, companies that they have to have uh, drivers with minimum three years experience and minimum 25 years of age. It's pretty hard to get any experience if if nobody will give you a job. So 
that's one of the other struggles that they're going through. Um, and the industry's even changed to try to help out, um, draw more drivers into that career path. The companies for, for pardon the expression, but they've been shifting gears and they've changed from manual transmissions into automatic transmissions to try and open up that driver pool and, and attract more drivers to this career path. But I've been in it for 35 years and, and it's been a struggle for a long time. And this is the worst that I've ever seen it as far as driver shortages, but that's kind of my two cents for that. Well, there's a funny, a funny thing of it. Just, I like to ask people, you know, again, we talk about the, the wages and maybe, you know, the, the pay, the rates of pay. If someone was to say to you, you're going to have a job where you're away from your family, you know, five, six days a week, 50 weeks of the year, how much would it take to get you to do that job? I guarantee you, most people at minimally $100,000 or more. You know? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, 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 you know, it's, 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 it, it's interesting, right? I mean, you, you know, I think it's, it's very acute in the truck space and, you know, you hear about it in other, you know, areas now with, you know, some of the unemployment benefits and stuff like that, people coming back from work and so forth, you know, you know, it's affecting us all over, but, you know, you can, it's really interesting listening to you guys that, you know, in hearing about, yeah, well, you know, I, I I thought the two earner the the two earner thing was was pretty interesting. The dual income family, I mean, just what a toll that puts on a family, and particularly if you know someone's gone, you know, all the time. Fascinating. The you know and, one of the hot topics out there is, you know, God, we've been printing money. Um, <laughs> you know, I was reading about the Fed this week, and you know, it, you know, everything's roaring, inflation's high. You know, what is the Fed going to do? Um, you know, Michael, help us make sense of, you know, what's going on with interest rates and financing and, and all of that. Are, are, are we too hot right now? All right. Well, uh, I don't know if I have any answer to the Fed. Honestly, the Fed's in a very tough position. You know, you've got uh, potentially, you know, an inflation problem on one hand, and then you've got still, you know, a COVID uh variant uh, issue on the other hand that uh, with potentially more restrictive um, things, you know, being reintroduced in terms of social mobility and potentially uh, a, a, a tap on the, you know, economic growth break uh, just from that alone. So what do you do? You, you've got, you know, and on one hand, you've got an incentive to keep rates as low as possible and to remain as dovish and accommodative as possible to still get through, you know, to the very end of the pandemic. And on the other hand, we're seeing some really, you know, pretty frightening uh, inflation numbers. So um, I wouldn't want to be in their chair right now. That's 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 for sure. Um, let me just, you know, quickly, we, we're getting short on time here, so I'll, I'll try to get through this quickly. Uh, what I'm going to show you will be we'll start off high level. Um, and a lot of this, you know, some of this anyway, won't be necessarily specific to the trucking industry, uh, but it's pretty safe to say that what I'm going to go through at a broader level um, translates pretty closely to what we're seeing and how we're currently approaching and operating in the area of truck financing. Um, so here on this slide, um, there are several good indicators of liquidity in the banking and broader financial system, but they pretty much all tell the same story that Matt just said, you know, that despite the relatively high unemployment rate and loss of payroll income, um, the fiscal and monetary responses have left the financial environment flush with liquidity, both in terms of capital already in the hands of businesses and consumers, as well in terms of banks just being willing to open up their purse strings about almost as wide as it's ever been, according to uh, the data on this slide. So what we're looking at is a long-term view across several decades and business cycles of the propensity of banks to either tighten or loosen their lending standards. And although this survey is in the context of large and medium-sized businesses, I think it's safe to say that the shape of the picture probably wouldn't change much for capital being available to small businesses um, through these same various cycles. So if you're not familiar with the survey and didn't take a moment to read the label, uh, the visual is almost a little counterintuitive, but what the line represents 
is a net score of responses by commercial loan officers to a quarterly Fed survey asking if banks are generally tightening or loosening their underwriting criteria. Uh, a high number means the environment is tighter and a lower number means it's looser and there's a higher propensity to lend. And you can see that around times of general macro stress and recession, banks have a natural tendency to tighten the purse strings as they become concerned about increasing delinquencies and defaults um, that permeate the environment. And conversely, during times when the outlook for economic growth is more optimistic and uh, there's going to be a natural uh, higher confidence in a borrower's ability to service their debt and likewise a greater willingness for, for banks to lend to those kind of credits. So that's that's what we're showing here. This is a super low number, almost, uh, you know, uh, almost at uh, historic lows in terms of, um, you know, a, a, a bank's willingness to, uh, um, uh, I should say, this. <laughs> I'm getting myself confused here. Uh, what, what this is showing is that banks are, are you know, super easy to to pretty much, uh, uh, you know, th there, there's a high propensity to lend right now. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> Some, sometimes we like to say banks aren't quite acting like banks. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Well, that, that's a good point. Uh, what we do see, uh, particularly in the truck financing industry, is that when things are, you know, when we're in an up cycle and, um, you know, there's there's plenty of demand for, for equipment, uh, we get a lot of Johnny come lately is looking for yield because they can't find yield anywhere else. Uh, they come into this market and uh, it's kind of free and easy money for them. And they come in at, you know, sometimes really, you know, almost irresponsibly low rates and um, and they're super easy to get money out of. The problem is when the cycle turns and we know it always does, um, you know, good luck trying to get somebody on the phone to help you out through a bit, you know, uh, more choppy waters. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, if, if not a, a nasty down cycle, uh, good luck with that. I mean, we've been around for 40 years. We've seen every cycle um, that anybody can remember. And, um, you know, we've, we've been there for, for our customers through thick and thin. And, uh, but a lot of these, you know, private equity money and hedge fund money comes into this market, has no idea what a down cycle looks like in this market, has no idea how to manage through it. And before you know it, uh, you know, it's it's a big problem for the borrower on the other side. So here on this slide, we've got a, a 10 year history of three and five year swap rate pricing uh, without getting too nerdy about the swap market. Basically, the takeaway from this picture is that since about the middle of last year, financial market participants have increased their expectations for interest rates three and five years out, which is not surprising. It's pretty much what you would expect in a recovery and a relatively healthy macro growth outlook and importantly you can see a positive spread or a gap between the three and five year outlook suggesting a normal expectation that the economic expansion will probably continue beyond three years um, and just a little bit of a disclaimer here this is not a bmo forecast uh, for rates but this is kind of what we look towards actually to understand better what the market is thinking about and, and signaling about the future direction of rates, if not the absolute levels. Um, so, um, and, and just to point out actually another takeaway, uh, at least at the moment, the market is still maybe unconvinced about the absolute robustness of this recovery and the possibility that interest rates therefore may not reobtain their prior levels if this recovery is not as strong as what was previously previously expected prior to the pandemic. Uh, time's going to tell, but it's always interesting to see what this swap market is is signaling for us. Uh, so, lastly, this is a picture. Uh, uh, it's a it's really a sight for sore eyes from a lender standpoint, and we've seen delinquency and, and default rates improve dramatically over the past year. In fact, the trend has brought the level of troubled credits to below pre-pandemic levels, no doubt thanks to the combination of a great freight rate environment, um, which we talked about, uh, low fuel costs uh, up until fairly recently anyway, 
uh, lots of freight, and then you throw in a healthy amount of PPP, and we're now at the lowest level of delinquencies actually in, in several year, years. Um, so just to wrap it up, um, there's plenty of liquidity out there as hard as it is to find a driver or a new truck or even a used truck. Uh, there is no shortage of, uh, of, of liquidity out there and capital to be had. Um, maybe even a little bit too much um, as, as we have seen a rash of these uh, Johnny come lately uh, come into the market, um, uh, especially when they can't find yield anywhere else. Um, but if you exclude the reserves that you know, all the banks had to take last year and are now unwinding this year. Um, we actually had a, a pretty good year overall last year, uh, given how the year started, certainly. And we're having a, a very good start to this year. Um, but we're frustrated, uh, like the rest of the industry, in that we feel like we could be dealing uh, a heck of a lot more volume uh, if there were more new and used trucks out there uh, available to be uh, financed for uh for purchase, um, but we're also optimistic that the supply chain issues will iron themselves out and that the macro and freight trends will, will remain strong through next year so that any money that might be left on the table this year due to all the supply uh, issues, hopefully it'll, it'll still be available uh, for next year. Wow, I mean, I, I, I just, <laughs> I, I have to say that, uh, that was a that was an hour. We probably packed a semester of economics in, into one hour. Uh, you know, with, with all the information we shared from labor to financing to supply chain. Um, you know, somebody could get their MBA on this on on this hour. Anyway, the, I, I just want to I want to thank everybody. We we had one question I wanted to come back to. Um, you know, uh, it was around refurbishment actually, and somebody asking. You know, hey, is the ROI on maintenance right now probably as high it has as it has ever been given the the pricing environment? Um, you know, seems like a, a logical question, Rob. I, I don't I don't know if uh, you want to take a shot at that, but you know, hey, if you got to hold on to something, seems like you might want to be paying to you know maintain it. Thank you on mute, Rob. How's that? There you yeah. go. Yep. Okay. So, I mean, right now, yeah, I mean, the um, there's certainly more of an opportunity for you to collect back any reconditioning you spend in today's market than there have been in the past, let's just say, five years, right? Um, just because we're seeing such a high number uh, for the equipment we're getting. But for the most part, you know, if you're spending cleanup on uh, a 2018, there's not a lot of cleanup that needs to be done. And, and I'm under the impression that, you know, there's not a lot of body work. Tires are pretty good. The older you get, the more you're going to spend. Um, the newer the truck, the higher the expectation that it's it's in much better condition. But in today's world, yes, the dollars you're spending, there's more likelihood. And, and realistically, even in bad times, people still want good trucks. Back to what Michael said, nobody wants to be embarrassed by something they bring back to their wife or their shop or by anybody else. So you, you want to you wanna make sure that you're getting the truck in a condition that, that the end user is going to be willing to accept and put on the road. Um, you know, they may have to do some things on their own. You know, R Richie Brothers has a has a list of things that we can do for you: clean up, paint, things like that. Um, so, yes, to answer your question, I would say right now is the best time you could probably collect back any of those dollars. Okay, yeah, I awesome. Um, I just want I know we're at time. Um, this uh, once again, I knew we were going to be chock full of great content. I want to thank everybody for participating. I want to thank everybody for listening. You know, we've recorded this. Uh, we're going to be disseminating this in, in various bits and pieces. Uh, once again, you know, these truck panels, uh, you know, those of you who have participated in the past, those of you who are new, uh, just chock full of insights here uh, and, and appreciate the contribution from everybody. So everybody stay safe out there. Get vaccinated. Hopefully soon we'll be able to get together. And, um, you know, like I said, 
uh, you know, have a good rest of your summer and, and we'll see you soon. Thanks everyone.